This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Markets are on high alert. Investors juggling disappointing earnings, rate bets, and out-of-cycle rebalances in the NASDAQ 100. It's a pivotal week ahead for central banks, and it's already shaping up this morning. The end falls on a scoop. The Bank of Japan sees little need to act next week. And in the UK, Rishi Sunak suffers a dramatic political upset while the country's competition and markets authority flexes its antitrust power. We speak of the CMA CEO, Sarah Cardell, this hour. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Kriti, as if earnings, as if U.S. data wasn't enough, that Bloomberg scoop over Japan shaking things up anew. Yeah, it absolutely is. You're already seeing a ripple effect into the bond market and the FX market. But interestingly, the stock market uh, to really trading to a different tune. I'm going to start there, though, Danny, because you are seeing NASDAQ 100 futures outperform right now to the tune of four tenths of one percent. That is significant given the carnage we've seen uh, in just yesterday's session, of course, coming off of the pretty poor earnings coming off of Netflix and Tesla. Looks like a little bit of a rebound. Now, that's pretty natural. When you see a big sell off like that, you tend to see a little bit of buying on the day after. Plus, remember, you just mentioned that NASDAQ rebalancing on Monday. So perhaps a little bit of positioning ahead of that, plus rebalancing for the end of the month as well. A lot of cross currents coming into the equity market. We're going to digest all of it throughout the hour. But for now, take a look at that bond market move, which is exactly what you just mentioned, coming off of the BOJ. I mean, a bigger move you're really seeing or in the dollar yen, 141.91. You're seeing dollar strength by about 1.3% there. Of course, coming on the headlines at the BOJ, basically saying there's little need to act on yield curve control. Of course, it's going to send uh, the Japanese yen even weaker. It's not, however, testing the weakest levels we've seen this year. So that's going to be interesting. How much of this is just more of what traders expected? Of course, the ripple effects are crucial as well. We have our eye on the 10-year yield, 385 on that note. And lastly, of course, Danny, a check on commodities. Brent crude trading at $80 a barrel. I got to say, Critty, it is kind of a bizarre day. It was a pretty bizarre day yesterday, I should say, with that tech sell-off, that bond market sell-off. Um, and it continues. The weirdness continues here in Europe. European stocks are able to notch an ever so slight gain. They are dragged down by really poor results from SAP after the bell yesterday. SAP seeing less demand than had been hoped. So those shares down more than four and a half percent. Sterling also, again, this was another really weird thing. I mean, it's a strange day for FX, so perhaps that explains the pound's movement. But we had U.K. retail sales come in much stronger than expected. Off the back of that, you get the logical response. You get a sterling which strengthens versus the dollar. But around the time of the BOJ announcement, I guess around the time that a lot of liquidity came into this market, a lot of trades were made, that wasn't sustained. We're now looking at losses versus the dollar for sterling. Same goes for this bond market. It seemed like the rally would be able to sustain itself if the BOJ will not be changing track. We were looking at buying on the front end of the German curve. That has now changed Critty to unchanged. Yeah, certainly something we're going to be keeping an eye on throughout the session. You're already seeing that volatility, as you pointed out, in the FX space. Let's stick with that. A major week of central bank decisions coming up, the Federal Reserve, the ECB, and the BOJ, all on the docket. That comes, as you pointed out and I pointed out, that Bloomberg is learning that the BOJ officials aren't seeing much need to act on yield curve control at this point. For more on that, Scoot Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us now. Valerie, look, we've heard this time and time again. You are seeing a market move, but perhaps not as big as expected. What is the read through or lack thereof into the other central banks? How do we interpret this? Look, I think this is not only just quite important, it takes a lot of volatility out of what we can possibly get next week. Now we know we don't have a yield curve control break on our hands. We kind of take a, a sigh of relief and just focus on what the Fed and the ECB can surprise us with. But I, for one, am very surprised about how much yen weakening we're seeing off the back of these headlines. The yen weakening some 1.2%, 1.3% versus the dollar. Uh, it really goes to show just how much uh, was priced into this market about a yield curve control break uh, next Friday. And I want to take a look about uh, where those yields have gone, uh, show you uh, how they have uh, reacted to the band. So this is uh, a, a kind of a historical uh, look about how yield curve control has moved. It started back in 2016. The band has been widened in some mode to help uh, the functioning of the bond market. But we're seeing on these announcements today, yields are ticking uh, down uh, lower, coming off of that 0.5% uh, uh, target that the Bank of Japan 
Japan uh, has currently uh, uh, on the 10 year yield. The current 10 year yield is now 45 basis points. But I really think that this is going to embolden the bond bulls a bit further. Uh, a YCC break was uh, one risk that you have to have uh, on your book if, if you're really thinking about going long the bond market, Danny, about really thinking about wanting to position for a recession, uh, positioning for a possible uh, blip, a weak blip in the U.S. data. Uh, being uh, long the bond market, this was the one big risk that could really shake you up that this, y this YCC break uh, could possibly happen next Friday. And now that we're not going to get that, Danny, I think the market's going to be even more emboldened by treasuries here. That, that's such a good point because you and I had talked about this. What ends the Treasury rally? It is the BOJ. Could the Fed or the ECB end it, Valerie? It's a big week for central banks, Danny. Next week, we get the Fed on Wednesday, the ECB on Thursday, and the Bank of Japan on Friday. We don't have to worry about the Bank of Japan anymore, so let's focus on the other two. We've got Jerome Powell taking the stand on Wednesday. We all know he's going to hike 25 basis points, but does he give any concession to that soft CPI print we got last week, or does he still really want to threaten this extra hike that could possibly come in the fall? We also heard some comments from Bernanke overnight saying that this July hike from the Fed could be their last. I have to say the market at the moment does agree with them. The, they really do doubt that extra dot on the dot plot thinking that the Fed is going to be done after July. And then on Thursday we get uh, Christine Lagarde taking the stand again. Widely expected for them to hike 25 basis points. But does she sound as hawkish as she did previously? Remember we've had some quite dovish comments from some very hawkish ECB members of late. Not wanting to talk about that hike in September. Does Lagarde openly leave that on the table as a live meeting or does she maybe start to talk about a pause in the cards and hands for the ECB? Certainly an awesome digest there. I think the highlight there was that Ben Bernanke might be right. Valerie Titel walking us through it. We thank you as always. Look, that's the macro story. We've got a ton of micro on deck as well ahead of that big rate decision that Valerie was just talking about just ahead as well of the Nasdaq 100 rebalancing aimed at reducing the big tech dominance in the index. The heavyweight firms, including Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA and Amazon, all set to get downward revisions. Bloomberg Sagarika, Jason Ghani joins us now for more. This is a really interesting story. The ripple effects and when it comes to kind of ETF investing, but also the exposure that's been a no brainer to the uh, Magnificent Seven. Walk us through who takes their place. Sure. Um, as you said, the Nasdaq 100 is due for a special rebalancing, uh, you know, to reduce the dominance of the big seven that have basically been responsible for the stunning rally that we've seen in the U.S. stocks um, this year. So the focus is now going to sort of shift to the smaller companies. And uh, the effect um, takes place on Monday, which means that today there could be a lot of stock market volatility, given that it is the last window for passive investors to to tweak their portfolios to bring it in line with the, the benchmark index. Also remember, today there's about 2.4 trillion worth of options that is uh, tied to stocks and indexes that are due to expire. So we could see a lot of um, erratic price action today. I mean, that is chaotic. <laughs> that is so chaotic, Sagarika. And, and I'd have to imagine that that liquidity also just gives people a chance to adjust positioning. Yes. Do you think we're going to see a big pullback in tech? I mean, we saw it yesterday. Is this the time to take profits? I think that's a very, very interesting juncture because we just had uh, data from Bank of America citing EPFR Global today. That was through Wednesday, so excluding yesterday's um, sort of pullback in the Nasdaq. But that showed that actually tech funds are still attracting a lot of inflows. And that's in contrast to broader U.S. equities, which had outflows overall. So it's quite interesting as to what we could see today. Um, also, because again, yes, uh, next week is a big week for earnings, right? It's the busiest week uh, for the season. We're going to hear from about 2.5, uh, sorry, 25 trillion dollars worth of companies throughout. The stakes are extremely high for big tech because not only are they, I mean, not only have they rallied so far this year, but they actually also expect to show the strongest profit growth. Okay. And what we saw yesterday with Netflix and Tesla when that didn't deliver, overall, just to give you some statistics, the pullback in the Nasdaq, um, it lost $400 billion in market cap just yesterday. So next week, and given all of the central bank action that's lined up, it could be a pivotal one. Yes, again, chaotic. Sagarika, absolutely chaotic. Sagarika, Jay Singh, Hani there helping us prepare for an interesting day and an interesting week ahead. All right, over here in the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak suffered a major political blow this morning. 
Ahead of a general election that's expected next year, voters rejected his party in two parliamentary elections in England. Joining us now is our UK correspondent Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, how big of a deal are these results? Well, he's had two thumping defeats, Danny. He's had lost Selby in the north to Labour, which is embarrassing because of the three, it's geographically closest to his own seat in North Yorkshire. But he's also lost um, Somerton in the southwest of England, which was by an even bigger uh, swing than Selby. That's gone to the Liberal Democrats. So it illustrates the challenges from two different parties at two different ends of the countries. However, he was spared a whitewash because they have managed to hang on to Uxbridge, which of course used to be the seat of the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. That might have been more to do with a row over ULES, the ultra low emission zone here in London that the Labour mayor of London has been talking about extending. So it might be more local factors there. In any case, it illustrates just how difficult the road ahead for Rishi Sunak is going to be as we move towards the general election next year. Bloomberg understands that's going to be November 2024, which is the point at which the Prime Minister hopes the economy is going to be looking a bit better. But there was some analysis from the ultimate po polling guru in the UK, uh, it's John Curtis, today. He said, by the looks of these results, it seems that... There hasn't been much electoral improvement by replacing Liz Truss with Rishi Sunak. A lot going on on the political front. Let's also get a little bit of your take on the economic front as well. We got retail sales from the UK this morning getting a big boost thanks to a hotter June than expected. Walk us through that data. Well, an analyst, uh, as they put it in a note to me this morning, UK consumers might have just bought themselves a bit more mortgage pain because these figures speak to the resilience in the UK economy. We did have that lower than expected CPI print the other day, but these the figures strengthen the case for more Bank of England hikes. That's what economists and markets are expecting. Bloomberg Economics say that those hikes will mean the UK economy faces a recession. And indeed, we had other figures this morning from GFK, a survey showing that consumer confidence slipped for the first time in six months in July. So that suggests a softening in the economy in the months ahead, a difficult backdrop for elections in the UK for Rishi Sunak. Lizzie, thank you very much for that update. Lizzie Burden there, our UK correspondent. Coming up, don't miss our interview with Sarah Cardell, chief executive of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority as we track the Microsoft Activision deal. And we're also going to get caught up with Koku Agabloa, SoftGen Global Head of Economic Research. So much to discuss later this hour. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Now, wheat is headed for a weekly gain of more than 10 percent on fears that growing threats to the Black Sea grain trade would curb supplies. Joining us on this is Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. So, Will, already a pretty big pickup this week, but can it go much further from here? Yeah, as you say, over 10 percent this week, which I ref think reflects the market's uh, view that the events this week and the back and forth and threats from Russia and Ukraine mean that the grain deal is dead and that ships are going to stop coming out of uh, Ukrainian ports with wheat and corn. But there's probably perhaps not that much more upside from here because the broader picture is that the global wheat market remains relatively well supplied. Harvests look good, especially from uh, Russia, which is one of the world's biggest uh, grain suppliers, another bumper harvest there, lots of exports, and that probably um, caps the upside uh, and maximizes uh, revenue from Russia from uh, this move. Well, you mentioned the really healthy harvest, and I'm interested to hear kind of the developments there. Of course, we know that the U.S. plays a big role in that in terms of exporting. In the last couple of weeks, we've also heard about kind of protectionism making a reemergence, not necessarily in the wheat space, but in the rice space, for example. How much of that is going to affect the commodity market as a whole? Yeah, the rice news is important, Kriti. Clearly, uh, rice is one of the world's most important foodstuffs, uh, feeds billions of people in Asia especially but across the globe and it is a matter of concern and perhaps uh, one of the bigger news bigger pieces of news in the food market uh, this week that India decided to ban some forms of rice export there may be more curbs to follow and that 
if that trend continues, if we do see a rally in rice prices, that perhaps could be a bigger food inflation story, a bigger hunger story than the events we've seen in the Black Sea this week, important though they are. Well, one of the other stressors on agriculture price has been the price of energy. And right now we'll, we're grappling with a heat wave. I mean, if you live in Sardinia, I, I, I really am concerned about any of our viewers who are there. How does that feed into this overall picture if we're potentially looking at more air conditioning usage? Yes, uh, right now in Europe, the gas uh, prices is, is relatively restrained, but clearly is a long term trend. More and more cooling means more and more uh, electricity to demand and in the short term uh, some of that gap can be filled by renewables and we're seeing a lot of solar power deployed around the world but some of it will have to come from natural gas and what that means is you may be using more natural gas in the summer than in the past and that sort of gap that historically you've seen between demand in winter and demand in summer closes uh, a little bit. Right now uh, the European uh, gas price has edged up a bit uh, recently perhaps on concern that Russia may seek to influence the uh, market again, you know, looking at what they've done with wheat. But demand from cooling hasn't been that noticeable. But I think you're right, Danny, to say that it's a longer term trend that we need to watch. Mm. Well, you were talking about kind of the natural gas story. Square that then with the oil story. I know stateside here, there is this kind of divergence in terms of how much utilities use natural gas relative to oil based on just how they're priced. Talk to us about the dynamic internationally between the two. Well, the oil market uh, remains uh, in a gentle upswing. Uh, we have seen a fourth uh, week of weekly gains in the oil market. I think in the oil market now what we're seeing is a, a tug of war between the supply situation where uh, Saudi Arabia has instituted that million barrel uh, a day cut in July and August. We're finally seeing signs that Russian exports may be starting uh, to fall and they're following through on their commitments. But that's balanced between... Uh, by weak industrial demand that we're seeing in China, concerns over the matra pitra in, in China, and some uh, weakness more broadly in the petrochemical uh, sector, Kriti. Um, so we're seeing those two things trying to uh, balance each other up. Right now, to some extent, the uh, demand, uh, sorry, the supply picture seems to be winning out and prices are gently creeping higher. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, what happens next week then when we get a flurry of, of central bank action? Does the macro picture take over, take back control when it comes to oil prices? Yeah, I mean, the other thing that you've got going on with oil prices, of course, is the dollar. And one of the things that is driving oil higher, there tends to be this inverse correlation between the dollar and um, uh, oil. And as the dollar has fallen away, as people have thought that maybe the tightening cycle is ending, uh, that's one other reason to drive oil prices higher. So it'll be interesting to see if that dynamic uh, follows through as central bankers take those decisions next week. Yep, there's a lot happening next week, Will. Will Kennedy there from our commodities team. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, it's the news all anyone cares about. It's Bobby, Barbie and Oppenheimer. It's because I'm used to saying Barb and Heimer. I can't say them separately, apparently. They're both hitting the big screen today, potentially making this weekend the busiest for theaters since the pandemic. We're gonna have more on that for you next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. This weekend, it is Barbie versus Oppenheimer. There's plenty of evidence that people around the globe are going to see both of them, are going to see two of the most anticipated movies of the summer. Total domestic box office receipts are tracking well over $200 million for the weekend, which could be one of the busiest for cinemas since the pandemic, according to box office pro forecasts as hype for films explodes. Critty, my question for you is, do you see a double showing? And if you do, what order do you see it in? That is really tough. And I got to say... <laughs> I, for me, I'm a personally, I'm a Mission Impossible fan, so I think I'm going to go see that one first. Oh. I'm going to throw a third option in there, but I have to say, uh, look, you, you, you got to see Barbie first, right? You can't, you got, you can't have kind of the weight of Oppenheimer followed by Barbie. To, to, to wait, me, wait, wait, no, 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 Critty, Critty, you got to do it the other way. Oppenheimer will bring you down. You can't end on that note. You end on Barbie, so you leave the theater saying, "Oh, that was lovely." 
Okay, so it's safe that you and I aren't seeing this double feature together because <laughs> yeah. our orders are completely <laughs> different. But Danny, I think it's also worth talking about just how this was really uh, coming coming about because in this era of Hollywood, we of course know this uh, return to the theater is, is something that is a bit rare. They've really had kind of their work cut out for them. And it's also coming at a time when the strikes in Hollywood are kind of affecting the marketing campaign. You know, the likes of Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, uh, and others who are starring in the movie have said, look, we support the unions. And that's really eating into this massive marketing budget that Mattel has for the film. Yeah, even to the point where uh, during the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer premiere here in London, you had the stars walking off of the premiere. They left and they said the strike has started because the strike started literally while they were on the red carpet. They all left. And so there's some degree, it does feel like this is kind of the last big narrative we're going to get for some time unless those strikes get figured out. So maybe that adds to the rush of going to the cinema. I'm, I'm unsure, Critty. Yeah, we'll have to certainly see when those uh, full numbers come out and say like a month or so. The labor story is certainly important, but so is kind of the Mattel rebound. Look, this is Mattel Films' first actual film. This is the part of the business only been in play for about four years. So also a big experiment on the toy maker's side. Yeah, it definitely is. All right, we're going to get away from the world of toys and movies. Up next, we're going to be talking markets with SoftGen's Koku Agabloa. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. U.S. markets are on high alert. Investors juggling disappointing earnings on the one hand, rate bets, and an out-of-cycle rebounds the Nasdaq 100 on the other. Plus, a pivotal week ahead for central banks already shaping up this morning. The yen falls on a scoop that the Bank of Japan sees little need to act next week. And in the U.K., Rishi Sunak suffers a dramatic political upset. While the country's Competition and Markets Authority flexes its antitrust power, we speak with the CMA CEO Sarah Cardell this hour. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Look, Danny, they clearly didn't coordinate when they set up these tech earnings alongside a lot of these central <laughs> bank decisions, factor in the scoops that we're getting, and it creates a lot of cross currents for the markets. It really does. I, I want to get Microsoft, Casio Ueda, Fed Chair, Lagarde. <laughs> I want to get them all on the phone and say, guys, just, just take a break, please. Just, just leave us alone. We have so <laughs> much to deal with. So there's a lot of cross currents right now at this moment. Now, on the earnings front when it comes to Europe, it's also tech pretty that's moving things around here. Uh, Europe stock 600 just barely able to hold on to gains because it's being dragged down. The tech powerhouse of Europe, SAP, the cloud software company, they had earnings after the bell yesterday. They underperformed those shares falling some 4%. A lot of volatility in FX and rates, it seemed to have calmed down in the last 30 minutes. So we got UK retail sales data hotter than expected. The immediate reaction was a strengthening of sterling. That's come back into the trend we've seen this week of weaker sterling post UK CPI. German two year yields, that was a bigger rally than we flipped to losses. Now we're kind of unchanged, kind of rallying. It's a lot to digest, Critty, when you're also looking at, okay, now the BOJ is standing pat. Well, it's certainly a lot to digest, and I think a lot of the sentiments that you're seeing in Europe are really translating into the U.S. session as well. Already it's 5.30 a.m., and you're seeing that dynamic play out. The Nasdaq 100 features, for example, higher by three-tenths of one percent. Again, it's that tech story that you were just pointing to in the European session, the idea of perhaps a little bit of rebound, a little bit of repositioning ahead of the Nasdaq 100 rebounds on Monday, but also just month-end rebalancing anyway. So a lot of folks perhaps buying in after that big sell-off we saw yesterday as well. So certainly something to keep an eye on in terms of the momentum we're going to see in the tech space. But look, the bond market, the FX market on a completely different page. The BOJ, the highlight of this morning. Dollar yen is where we're uh, catching our eye. 141.78 keeps fluctuating, but higher by about 1.2% when it comes to dollar strength there. What's interesting is that we're not seeing the Japanese yen test those lower uh, levels yet. And that's really important because as we go into the BOJ decision next week, look, the scoop certainly moved the market. Did it move the market as much as perhaps we would have expected two, three months ago? Maybe not. And that's going to be something we digest in just a moment. The bond market, as you would usually take its cue from something like that, right now, not so much. 385 on the 10 year yield, kind of virtually unchanged there. And of course, Danny, our courtesy check on the commodity market, Brent crude trading at about $80 a, hand, a barrel. Oh, not just a, 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 a nice thing for you to do today. That's a pretty big move, Critty. Finally, oil playing up. All right. <laughs> Here's the actual big move, though. Let's be honest. It is the yen. It's what Critty and I both mentioned, a great scoop from the Bloomberg team in Japan. That 
the BOJ likely is not going to be moving next week. There won't be tweaking yield curve control. They say the bond market is functioning fine. We don't want to signal to the market that we're tightening things from here on out, so we stand pat next Friday. Let's bring in Koku Agablua now, Global Head of Economics, Cross-Asset, and Quant Research at SockGen. Koku, i got to be honest, before that Bloomberg scoop, I was willing to put money on the fact that we'd get a YCC tweak, and this is another great example of why I have the job I have now, and I'm not indeed a trader. But what do you make of this, the fact that the BOJ says, nope, we don't need to act yet? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, Danny, this is, uh, we were also in the same camp. Uh, we were expecting the widening of the uh, fluctuation range permitted for 10-year JGB yield, uh, essentially going from plus minus 50 basis points to 100 basis points. So we've essentially extended our call for that to occur in September. Uh, it is quite interesting because it really shows how determined um, the Bank of Japan are in making sure that um, they don't slip back into a sort of def deflationary or disinflationary spiral. Um, and it is interesting because if you look at the rest of the world, everybody's sort of seeing a disinflation, uh, dis disinflationary pressure with, you know, headline CPI uh, rolling over, even though core remains the problem. Um, but I guess when it comes to Japan, they've learned from history and, and really uh, being consistent uh, with their uh, strategy goal of making inflation sustainably higher um, as opposed to creating a, a mean reversion back to uh, the, the, its history. One of the things in terms of this overall bond market rally, Koku, that could have derailed it would be any tweak to YCC. That seemed to kind of be the big unknown factor. If that's no longer an unknown, if there's less volatility now around the BOJ's decision, is this kind of an all clear to see that bond market rally continue? Yeah, probably. But although it, it will also depend on, on how the uh, U.S. Treasury yields behave, um, because, you know, when you have sort of upward pressure on, on yield, it typically has put upward pressure on JGBs as well, because you get uh, selling of, of JGBs and, and sort of attraction towards uh, U.S. Treasuries. Um, but uh, with a, a lot of that inflationary uh, pressure easing and uh, fears of a recession, that is, by the way, not happening yet, at least when you're looking at the equity markets. Uh, I think that's clearly going to um, ease the, uh, the, uh, the sell-off and, and, and create more uh, bullish momentum in, 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 in the bond market. Koku, speaking of that bond market, a couple months ago when we were again talking about this yield curve control story, it felt like there was this sentiment in the market that we are right on the cusp of something breaking. It feels like that sentiment has since faded. Talk to us a little bit about this idea of the cues that the rest of the world are taking from a bond market that maybe isn't necessarily as worried about the BOJ, despite them sticking to the same framework they had a couple months ago. Hmm. Well, I think the world has changed to some extent. Uh, if you go back to a few uh, months ago, we were uh, essentially saying that you know, you know that central banks will have to tighten and raise interest rate by uh, a lot more than what was priced by the market, uh, simply because we saw core inflation being pretty strong. Um, you have household and uh, corporates have, having developed a sort of natural immunity against interest rate because companies have refinanced themselves up to you know five to ten years and therefore less sensitive to higher interest rates and then you have a household benefiting from uh, uh, SX, excess savings at the peak it was close to two and a half trillion dollars in the US and at least the recent um, sort of um, CPI core shows that there's a gradual slowdown in, in core and that's quite reassuring and, and therefore the amount of tightening and, and uh, uncertainty uh, and upward pressure on, on yield in, in the U.S. bond market has sort of eased, and that's created a sort of contagion across the curve. I mean, the best example is the U.K., the gilt market as well. Uh, you know, the latest data were essentially softer that created a, a weakness in the sterling, even though retail sales recently are, are back higher. Though, so that's created a lot of uncertainty. But I think, generally speaking, the sentiment is, is a lot more... Um, less uh, fearful of another massive way of, of, of tacking. Well, I love that you mentioned the currency space. You must be saying something very interesting and very newsworthy, given how many messages you are getting immediately at the moment. Very popular, clearly, at 5.30 a.m. Uh, New York time. Cuckoo, talk to us a little bit more about the currency picture here. At what point do these rate hikes that you're continuing to see with the ECB, the BOE, end up becoming a weakness for, current, for currencies in Europe right now. When do we see that kind of rate differential dynamic switch? 
Mm. I think the, the strength in the euro dollar, uh, I mean, it's ultimately a dollar story because clearly the Fed has been pretty uh, aggressive in, in tackling this inflation outbreak that we uh, all uh, observed as a consequence of this massive fiscal and monetary stimulus to save human lives uh, after the COVID uh, crisis. And um, and today we're starting to see uh, you know, peak interest rate at roughly five and a half in the U.S. And we think there are pause going forward. But the bank, the uh, well, the ECB and the Bank of Wigan have are essentially behind the curve. And one of the key reasons to bear that in mind, to, to bear in mind, is the fact that historically it used to be a lack of demand problem, uh, where demand was constrained. Today, what we're seeing is a supply that's constrained. We have demand at way above ex uh, supply, and therefore you need to create a lot more demand destruction, a lot more unemployment to get inflation down. Um, so mm. currencies are going to follow interest rate differentials, as you mentioned, and therefore we see more upside on the euro, on the euro versus the dollar. And we think the dollar is, is essentially going to be on a downward trend uh, going forward. Uh, and and the, the sterling and the euro will have to play catch up in, in dealing and, and, and fighting inflation, particularly on the core uh, inflation side. Coco, I, w I just want to know what everyone is IBing you right now. I hear, I hear it going off. Are they agreeing or disagreeing with you? What are those messages you're getting? <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, probably agreeing to disagree, but uh, a combination. There of we go. <laughs> <laughs> Koku, I mean, come on, that's what we have you on, the controversial topics. Look, I love this from your notes. Momentum or fundamentals, that is the key call. What is it, Koku? Is this a market based on momentum or fundamentals right now? Well, this is a very good point. Uh, there's a huge dissonance and, and um, well, battle between the fundamentals that looks pretty strong. You can think about greedflation, for example, so this ability of corporate to pass on higher prices by more than is warranted. And that's why we see profit margins at levels not seen for, for the past 15 years. And yet you are also seeing this massive tightening in liquidity, higher interest rate that is supposed to create a slowdown in demand. Uh, and yet you have this, this dissonance between the bond market on one side and the equity market. So there's a bit of a fear of missing out, uh, so to speak. And we see uh, a lot of positioning that was pretty bearish in equities at the beginning of the year because of that whole re recession rhetoric. And that that's why there's a momentum to, to rebalance multi-asset portfolios back into uh, a, a more balanced equity bond allocation. Uh, and we see a lot of investors overweight bonds because that's sort of the asset class you want to be in if you expect a recession. So I think, um, I think the jury is still out as to how severe the recession is likely to be. Our house view is that uh, we won't see a recession in Europe and we will see a mild recession in Q1 of next year for the US simply because, to finish on this point, it takes three to five quarters for interest rate to hit the economy. And because of that immunity of household and corporates, it will take a bit longer than usual uh, to create sort of the normalization in core inflation that central banks are desperate, desperately looking for. Certainly a lot to digest in this next week. Sakjen's Kuku Agwabula all over that story. We thank you as always for joining the program. Coming up, we go from the macro to the micro. We're going to speak to Sarah Cardell, Chief Executive Officer of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, a conversation you do not want to miss. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition faces one last hurdle, the UK's CMA. The deadline for the deal has been extended until October 18th, but no proposal has been put forth just yet. In an interview with Sky News, the CEO of the Competition Markets Authority, Sarah Cardell, said, quote, the ball's very much in Microsoft's court. She joins us now for more on the deal. Sarah, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining the program. Look, let's get straight into the nitty gritty of this deal. A lot of questions about what a remedy that would suit the CMA might look like. Talk to us a little bit about the possibility of a divestiture. Is that something that the CMA would approve should Microsoft propose that? So I think the first thing to say is that at the moment, our decision on prohibition stands. We investigated very thoroughly 
the deal, we found that there were serious concerns in relation to cloud gaming. And the proposals that were put forward by Microsoft at the time did not resolve our competition concerns. So Microsoft have indicated that they are considering how they might restructure the deal in a way that resolves our concerns. And really, as I say, it is up to them to come forward with a proposal that satisfies those concerns. And to be clear, it needs to satisfy those concerns fully and comprehensively. So a divestment may be one option, but it's really up to them to come forward with a proposal that meets our requirements. Sarah, some would argue that a divestiture is the only option given that the CMA has been very vocal about a licensing deal, something that the FTC, excuse me, that the federal courts in the US and the European Commission have actually approved. Talk to us about why perhaps a divestiture is a better alternative to a licensing deal. So the thing that really matters here is making sure that this market remains open and competitive. We know that when we're looking at cloud gaming, it's a new, emerging, dynamic market where we want innovation to, to flourish, to thrive. We want a whole host of different companies to be able to compete effectively in that market. And I think it's really important to focus on the outcome there rather than you know, precisely how that might be achieved. As I say, it's not really for the CMA to design that for Microsoft. It's for them to come up with the proposals that meet our requirements. But it's very much about keeping open the dynamics of the market. I mean, there have been criticisms, which I think are, are worth clearing up. This idea of a possible rethink comes off the back of a change in the US, off of Europe deciding this deal was OK. And from some vocal criticism from the likes of Jeremy Hunt, what do you say to those who say this rethink is due to outside pressure? I say absolutely not. We were very clear with our decision that there were serious concerns from this transaction. And as I say, that the remedies that were put forward by Microsoft at the time did not satisfy, did not resolve those concerns. And the way UK merger control works is that in the absence of a, of a proposal that resolves those concerns, we have no choice but to, to uh, prohibit that transaction. Now, it is up to Microsoft if they want to come up with a proposal that they think will address those concerns. That needs to be in the form of a, of a restructure. And if they do, we would consider, for example, whether that constitutes a new transaction that requires a new investigation. And I should say that this will need to go through a full formal process. So there will be a process of consultation, an opportunity for third parties to put their views on anything that comes to us. Um, what have you heard? from Microsoft in terms of submitting a material change? You say that they have. What, what is the material change that they've submitted? So it's perhaps helpful to distinguish two different elements here. So I think there's, you know, there's a lot of perhaps a little confusion, a little complexity to the process. What we have at the moment is the prohibition decision, and we are in the process of putting in place the final order that implements that prohibition decision. It is in all processes open to parties to put forward an argument that there has been a material change of circumstance. That is not necessarily the route that we would consider uh, when we're looking at any new proposal. We've also indicated that if there is a new structure on the table, that may well constitute a new transaction that requires a full new investigation. Sarah, is it still possible that the CMA doesn't accept any new proposals from Microsoft? I mean, how committed is your organization to actually seeing this deal through as opposed to stopping it completely? So the CMA is committed to make sure that there are no competition concerns resulting from this transaction. That is our legal responsibility. That is our obligation in making sure that markets remain competitive. Uh, we will consider any proposals that are put to us, but those proposals need to meet those concerns in order to secure any way forward for the transaction. So to be clear, it is still possible that the CMA doesn't approve any of Microsoft's proposals if it doesn't meet your qualifications. It is. And I'll, I'll leave you with this final question then, Sarah. When it comes to the precedent that this is setting for other deals like Broadcom, VMware, Adobe, Figma, uh, for example, even Adobe and uh, excuse me, Amazon iRobot, these are deals that the European Commission has gone on much, much harder than the UK has. When you talk about the broader tech sphere, why is Microsoft set apart from some of these other broad tech stories? So I don't think it's the case that there's a particular approach on Microsoft and, and a different approach on other deals. Uh, there are many, many transactions where uh, we take a, a very similar approach to the, the EC and to the US. And indeed, of course, it's important to remember that we had very much the same concerns about the impact of the transaction as the European Commission did. 
Uh, for example, if you look at the, the Adobe case, that's a case that we are still reviewing very carefully through our phase two investigation. So uh, it's by no means the case that we're singling out Microsoft in any way. We'll certainly keep an eye on that. Sarah Cardell, Chief Executive of the UK's Competition Markets Authority, thank you as always for joining the program. And of course, worth of getting a quick check on these shares. Microsoft shares higher this session by about four tenths of 1%, ticking, of course, as we were speaking to the CEO of the CMA. Their Activision Blizzard, on the other hand, pulling back a little to the tune of four tenths of 1%, trading just shy of $92 a share. Remember, $95 a share was the offer price. We are going to be keeping an eye on all of those moves as, of course, the moves in the broader tech space as well. Coming up, we get a checkup on the financial health of the U.S. consumer as earnings season ramps up next week. Tech, of course, a major part of that story. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. The consumer is set to be the star of this earnings season. Next week, we'll bring us a report card on consumer health in corporate America as well as crucial economic data. Simone Foxman is all over that story. She joins us for more. Simone, walk us through the big themes in focus for next week. Well, food and grocery. I mean, we have an enormous list of uh, various companies reporting, but food and grocery, one of the things I'm focused on, we'll see earnings from the likes of Colgate, Palmolive, Kimberly Clark, P&G. We've been talking about the sort of trade down stories as consumers move to cheaper products, but one of the things that's come up in recent weeks is that consumers just might not be buying as much at all. That's what we heard from the ConAgra CEO, consumers simply buying less. There's also been various data reports suggesting that sales of things like toothpaste, laundry detergent, toilet paper are going to be down three to four percent a year. Uh, another theme we're going to be watching on the food front is the idea that uh, food at home, so the kind of groceries you buy to eat at home, those prices have suddenly sort of stabilized while food outside the home at restaurants and the like, that's continued moving up significantly higher. That may be something we see in the earnings of McDonald's, Hershey, Coca-Cola, Chipotle. Hang on, Simone. Did I hear you right that toothpaste and did you say toilet paper sales are going to be down? Wait, what are people going to be doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, the idea is that people have some existing inventory and so maybe that they're not not buying toilet paper. They just are using what they can and sort of spending on other things, including experiences. We'll also get sort of a check on that when we get some of this data out, those GDP numbers, personal consumption. I think that's a, a, a signal that we're going to be watching for sure. All right, so that's the micro. Let's zoom out a little bit, talk about the macro, because then we also get a lot of eco data as well, which will give us a little bit more perspective. Walk us through that. Yeah, I mean, as I was talking about that personal consumption piece of GDP, that's really what held up GDP, caused us to come in a bit higher than anticipated last quarter. Of course, we'll see broader things, um, consumer confidence, there are various measures coming out next week, and of course, that important Fed decision. Another thing I'm watching too, and this will play out in earnings as well, is housing. We get our latest number on new home sales in the United States uh, next week. Those have, that We've seen a lot of strength in the housing market. Um, analysts do expect this to fall a little bit, but something we're also going to be watching in Sherwin-Williams, uh, right. some of the other home improvement names. Yeah, so consumer, eco data, central banks. So much. Tech. Yeah, so much. no one's going to sleep at Bloomberg uh, next week. <laughs> Simone Foxman, thank you as always. That does it for early edition surveillance is ahead with the CEO of Arsenal. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.